Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon for people that are seeing us from Brazil, other countries of Latin America, United States or Canada. Uh, good evening for people that are seeing us from Europe, especially our uh, members of Italy, Spain, United Kingdom, Portugal uh, and Germany. Okay, so uh, we will uh, have today the last webinar of the Structuralist Development Macroeconomics Research Group for the year 2023. And we have the pleasure to be uh, with us as a lecturer, Professor Peter Scott, that will bring the lecture uh, Structuralists and Behavior Macroeconomics as, uh, as a challenge to mainstream economics is basically based on his new book here. Uh, let me talk a little about uh, the, the CV or the bio of Professor uh, Peter Scott. Professor Peter Scott is currently professor at Alborg University Business School and emeritus professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Before moving to UMass in 2003, he held positions at Copenhagen University from 1981 to 1987 and Aarhus University uh, from 1987 to 2003. Uh, he still teaches occasionally at UMass Amherst and New School for Social Research. His research interests fall primarily within macroeconomics with contributions on a range of topics including economic growth and development, business cycles, inflation and income distribution. His general approach draws on the post-Keynesian, neo-Marxian and institutional traditions, as well as behavior economics. As, as, and he recently published a book on structuralist behavior macroeconomics that synthesizes some of his work on core macroeconomic issues. Peter, many thanks to have accepted our invitation. It's always a pleasure to receive you at the Strategist Development Macroeconomics Research Group. Well, to, to comment the, the, the lecture of Professor Peter Scott, we have uh, the honor to have with us, please, Daniel, bring him again, uh, in order to comment uh, Professor uh, Peter Scott lectures, we have the pleasure to have with us my former boss, Fernando Jolanda Barbosa, who was my boss at the the Ibemeki Faculty of Economics uh, in the late 90s. Well, uh, Professor Fernando Barbosa holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Canedo Mendes School of Political and Economic Societies, a bachelor's degree in engineering from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, a master's degree in economics from the University of Chicago, 1975, a master's degree in economics from Fundação Getúlio Vargas, and a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. He is currently a full professor at the uh, Getulio Vargas Foundation uh, post-graduate uh, program in economics. He was a former full professor at the Department of Production Engineering at Fluminense Federal University. He was also director of the research uh, at uh, graduate program in economics of Getulio Vargas Foundation and also secretary of economic policy under uh, Itamar Franco government. Uh, he was winner of the Award in 1985 and editor of the Brazilian Journal of Econometrics from 1986 to 1988. Professor Fernando Barbosa has been researching the inter interrelationship of monetary and fiscal policies. Some conclusions of his work is that A, government spending decreases when inflation rate increases, the origin of chronic inflation in Latin America is a fiscal conflict, not a conflict between capital and labor, with the public debt financed by money. Hyperinflation is an equilibrium path and a general equilibrium model with rational expectations when there is a fiscal crisis. The contagion effect of public debt on monetary policy transmits the country risk and exchange rate risk to our select short-term interest rate or policy rate. The natural interest rate in a small open economy is equal to the external interest rate plus country and exchange risks. The main works of 
Professor Fernando Ana Barbosa with his co-authors on chronic inflation that in hyperinflation are in a book exploring the mechanics of chronic inflation, hyperinflation, published in 2017 by Springer in Germany, if I'm not in error. Okay, so uh, many thanks, Fernando, for have accepting our invitation to, to comment uh, Peter's court uh, uh, webinar or lecture. So let us start with the start. Uh, Peter, please, uh, the audience is yours. Okay, thanks, Jose Luis. Um, I'm very uh, happy to be here again. I'm very happy to be given this opportunity to uh, present some of my work. Um, the title actually uh, comes from Professor Orero. Um, it's based on my on my book that came out just uh, just uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and uh, let me before I I move into more specific topics, I, I decided it would not be it would not be possible or, or interesting for me to try to cover everything in the book. So having given maybe a sort of brief outline of what I aim to do in the book and some of the main themes, I then want to, to move on and, and address a particular issue uh, in somewhat greater detail. So the background to the book uh, is a, an unhappiness with the state of macroeconomics. And I think there's fairly widespread dissatisfaction at the moment. Uh, rational expectations are being questioned. It's widely recognized that Euler equations do not give a good description of the dynamics of aggregate consumption. And the new Keynesian Phillips curve is by some observers uh, described as completely uh, uh, wrong uh, empirically and also I think hard to defend um, theoretically. If we were to dismiss those, uh, those elements, though, it's hard to see what is left of macroeconomic orthodoxy that has been dominant since sometime in the 1980s. Um, the question, the important question, it seems to me, is what should take its place? Um, and uh, that may not be obvious, and I think although there are many, many critics of, of macroeconomic orthodoxy, there is no real consensus on what should take it will take its place. And I think often there's very limited interaction between between critics, certainly the more radical critics and the the um, economists who have been trained in a mainstream uh, tradition. So what this book aims to do is is not to provide a survey of post-Keynesian macroeconomics. I guess I, if, you, if I were to put a label on myself, it would be something along post-Keynesian, neo-Marxian institutionalist. Uh, but this is not a survey of post-Keynesian economics. What I'm trying to do in the book is to, is to enter into a fairly detailed engagement with orthodoxy. And what I mean by that is trying to, uh, to uh, be more explicit about what I see as some of the main critiques that should and could be leveled against, against the, the mainstream. And they come both as sort of internal critiques. If you, if you um, accept the main terms, the main, uh, the main assumptions of, 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 say, rational behavior, well-defined preferences, intertemporal optimization, if you accept that, um, is it then a, a, a robust theory? And I would argue that it's not. And then there's the external critique, which is more a, a critique of the assumptions themselves, trying to highlight uh, what I see as, as serious weaknesses of deviations between the assumptions and the evidence that we have. And then, aside from the critique, of course, I want to outline what you could call, or what I have called, a structuralist and behavioral alternative. Try to sketch my version of what could be done instead. And I'm sure there are, there'll be many elements in what I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, even my friends will say, oh, no, I don't quite agree. But rather than try to offer a whole a long discussion, a survey of different of different answers. I decided it would be it would be more fruitful maybe just to lay out in a fairly coherent fashion 
what I see as as a promising approach. So in doing that, that uh, in laying this out, um, I also include a discussion analysis of uh, instability and growth cycles, and that's the topic I've decided to to look at in in uh, in somewhat greater detail today. Why that? Because one of the one of the sort of problems I think with much uh, of orthodox theory is that in some sense the coordination problems, the possible lack of, 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 of uh, market responses leading us to coordinated nice equilibrium outcomes um, is, is, uh, is problematic. And once you look at these dynamic interactions uh, between agents and across different markets, then I think one will have to uh, admit that that instability and, and dynamic processes that are more complex become uh, quite, quite likely. So this exemplifies some of that macroeconomic dynamics um, that I think could and, um, and should take the place of uh, DSG models. So let me highlight or just outline at least a couple of elements from the internal critique. Representative agents intertemporally optimizing are kind of the, the key element in, in, in DSG models. And I think using those agents just flies in the face of what we know about, about the impossibility of aggregating into this single agent. We can have every, every agent in a, in a, in a well-specified Barrasian type economy with with preferences that are that satisfy all the all the standard assumptions, and then if we try to aggregate those agents into into uh, a single agent whose behavior supposedly uh, describes the aggregate outcomes, we know that's not possible. It's possible only under extreme conditions. We also it should also be well known. But in fact, if we were to use a representative agent's utility function as a welfare criterion, then that would involve an intrinsic bias in favor of the rich. So assume we successfully construct this descriptive representative agent, then for it to, it to work descriptively, you have to give weight to those people whose preferences matter for the market outcome. And if you have no money, you don't influence market outcomes. It's the rich who influence the most. So we have to give greater weight to their preferences. And almost as a corollary of that, the agent is subject to a Lucas critique. If we change the income distribution, then in general, we'd need to change the definition of the representative agent. So internally, the Lucas critique may have identified a problem, but the solution makes no sense. Natural rates of unemployment, a key element of, of um, mainstream macroeconomic theory, subject to um, great empirical weaknesses and also to theoretical fragility. If you modify a few assumptions, but still keeping the sort of basic optimization frameworks, you may not get a, uh, a natural rate of unemployment. Neoclassical production functions, there may be a choice of technique, nobody should deny that. But the fact that firms may have a choice of technique does not legitimize the use of a, an aggregate conductless function that's nice and smooth and you move along it. Um, the capital controversy should have highlighted that and made that clear to everybody. And in fact, um, that, that was what Samuelson pretty much admitted uh, at the end of that debate. Um, and yet the neoclassical production function is ubiquitous in, in macroeconomic theory today. There's the assumption that, that the, the, uh, the steady growth path tends to be stable. If stable, we would converge to it in the absence of shock. But we, met, we have known since the 1970s, the work of Sonnenschein and others, that, uh, that in fact, there is absolutely no reason 
to um, assume that a Balrasian general equilibrium will be stable. And yet we just take that for granted and thereby excluding some of the issues that, that I want to focus on today, the um, possibility of unstable steady growth paths and, and what that may mean. So these are some of the, of the internal critiques. External critiques, um, if you look at household consumption and household financial behavior, then I think we have abundant uh, behavioral evidence, evidence from, from other social sciences as well, suggesting that we have systematic and macroeconomically relevant deviations from the assumptions and predictions of standard economic theory at the micro level. So the standard assumptions, it seemed to me, if one wants to be truly behavioral, we should not go with the simple model. There are all kinds of issues that have been found to be systematic, framing effects, present bias, social preferences, a sort of bounded rationality that leads to rational inattention, if, uh, inattention if you want to use um, a sort of standard term used in, in, in mainstream. These are all well documented. And they have, I argue, systematic effects when we look at, for instance, retirement savings. It have, they have systematic effect when we look at the financial sphere, at portfolio choice, and when we try to discern, determine saving rates in a corporate economy. In a corporate economy, given all of this, all we know about decision making, firms financial decisions will become very important and will influence the saving rate. Labor markets and wage formation, we know we have strong evidence that social norms and fairness play important roles in wage determination and inflation. Why do they do that or what do they lead to? While well, reference points are important, we get wage stickiness and money illusion as as likely outcomes, again, well documented. We can get because social norms, social norms are path dependent. A social norm needs to be confirmed by, by actual outcomes in order for it to be sustained. And sort of by the same token or conversely, if something is sustained, if outcomes occur over and over again, they tend to become accepted and tend to gain the status of a social norm. And if you apply that reasoning or think of that in the context of the labor market, then you would tend to get employment hysteresis and path dependent earnings distribution. Income inequality now has to be viewed in, in different ways. You also have to, to be aware, I think, that let me skip the power bias, technology, institutional change. We have to talk about that for a long time. I think it's important. Um, but let me just mention that if we talk labor markets, I think it's also essential to p take into account structuralist features. I don't think it's reasonable in any way to use the same models of inflation in an economy like Germany or the US and then go and do it in, in Brazil or in Nigeria or in economies that are quite different. Mature economies versus dual economies have different processes and uh, they require different policies in many cases. And that distinction is often lost in, in contemporary macro. So turning now to what happens if we, if we if we try to build on these uh, behavioral uh, assumptions and if we take into account the, the existence of, of different agents, decision makers, interactions across markets. When the book I first uh, go through a sort of standard short run analysis, standard Keynesian theory and discuss Keynes's instability argument, Unemployment is not likely to get uh, to get eliminated simply through through um, uh, the automatic movements of wages and prices. It's an argument that needs to get modified because once you move from a situation where you have where you have exogenous money supplies 
to a situation where where Taylor rules uh, active monetary policy govern what's happening uh, with with the money supply then uh, that it does introduce stabilizing features through policy then extending the the analysis to the longer term i look at long run growth patterns without a neoclassical production function i discuss how local instability of the steady growth path is likely to be what we'll find and i discuss how that needs to or can lead to endogenous growth cycles that's the in red here because that's the topic that i want to delve into in more detail i then look at, at more long-run sort of fiscal policy debt issues and um, and argue that um, that uh, mature economies economies that are kind of fluctuating not too far from what we could call full employment but they may actually be subject to structural aggregate demand problems that may require a, a sustained fiscal <laughs> stimulus and thereby uh, an increasing or a high debt level. But here's an example of the difference between, between um, uh, mature and dual economies. If you look at a dual economy, then they do not face the same structural aggregate demand problem what they face is a structural transformation problem and that actually calls for somewhat different policies and makes uh, expansionary demand policy in some respects uh, quite dangerous um, so so these are some of the micro uh, micro uh, economic uh, the macroeconomic uh, issues that i that i look at and overall the argument of the book is that is that this sort of behaviorally founded we need a micro story we can't just have sort of uh, um, macro relations coming out of the blue because they seem to fit we need to have a micro story but we need to um, also look at the structural constraints as it were the institutional context and tell this integrated macro mac micro macro story and uh, when we do that then we, we get uh, we get interesting dynamics that i think uh, fits uh, a lot of the evidence much better than a um, a standard dsge type or, or uh, approach that has been been sort of the uh, the uh, main story in in uh, in the last 30 40 years so having gone through this sort of brief overview of the themes let me turn to to the question of endogenous growth cycles and economic policy of course the background as i guess i may have mentioned already is that uh, these days it's um, the the, um, the dominant view is that business cycles are, are shock induced in the absence of stochastic okay. shocks we would get convergence to a a uh, a steady growth path um, nobody would deny that that uh, shocks occur that macro macro economies are hit by stochastic shocks i mean if one wanted to if one wanted to get a um, a simple example one need look no further than than the COVID epidemic which obviously was um, was a, a very large uh, shock uh, that no one would have explained endogenously in a, in a macroeconomic model. Um, so, so shocks occur, um, but the question is, in the absence of shocks, would there be instabilities and endogenous cyclical movements? So the, 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 the separation between people who look at, look at business cycles as being endogenous and those who view them as being exogenous is not really it seems to me the question of shocks it's the question of what is the behavior of the economy how would it perform in the absence of shocks you can clearly add shocks to a model that has endogenous cyclical fluctuations you would just get fluctuations that would be less regular um, so so that's not that's not the issue um, so, since I want to highlight that difference between what would happen in the absence of shocks and what follows, there would be no stochastic shocks, it'll be purely deterministic. 
And um, let me give you the uh, the punchlines uh, so that if I do get get um, get uh, short on time later on, get get squeezed, then um, at least you have some of those. What I want to argue is that an empirically based calibration of a baseline, I'd call it here Marx Keynes model, actually fits many stylized facts of US business cycles. I would argue that if that baseline, very simple model is extended to include economic policy rules and few other extensions, then the outcomes become much more robust. And they also fit much better. You get, you get uh, more stylized facts being covered and, uh, and uh, covered in a more convincing manner, I would suggest. The, the robustness here, why do I stress that? I stress that because I think a, a weakness of many um, dynamic macroeconomic models uh, is that the outcome uh, may be very sensitive to precise parameter values. You have a lot of models that, that produce endogenous cycles, but often, often they, are, they are sensitive to precisely how you specify them and precisely what parameter values you use. And this, this great sensitivity is troublesome. And so to find that once you include policy rules and a couple of other extensions that I think are empirically well motivated, then the outcomes become robust and that's that's quite uh, that's quite interesting and i think quite important and then i want to argue briefly that of course economic policy rules themselves are not exogenous they are endogenous and the fact that they adjust to outcomes they change if performance is poor then that may actually um, help to to stabilize the system even more. If there were to be a dramatic change in the private sector that led to really poor outcomes, then policymakers would try to intervene and, uh, and uh, do something to remedy the situation. They may not succeed. I'm not suggesting that policy is optimal, whatever that may mean, but there will be, there will be a reaction. Okay, so brief overview. I'll talk a little bit first about price and output flexibility. Um, and then I'll outline my baseline keynes marx models with fixed prices. Go through assumptions and dynamic properties and then calibrate and simulate. I'll then introduce the, extension, the extended model, economic policy, wage and price dynamics, investment functions become more satisfactory. And again, I will calibrate and simulate and then hopefully I will have time for a couple of brief concluding remarks. So price flexibility, I mean, I, I, I bring this up because as some of you may be aware, uh, I have in the past always advocated uh, very flexible prices and my, uh, my uh, cycle model from 1988 um, went to the extreme and said uh, prices are jump variables that sort of clear the market in the ultra short run. I still, I still maintain that position with respect to many goods, many prices. I think, I think, I think in general, uh, post Keynesians along with new Keynesians make a mistake by insisting that, that uh, prices are, are fixed or sticky in the short run. Um, and I've never understood why. I mean, and that's an empirical, that's an empirical uh, 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 puzzle. Uh, because, I mean, I've always thought that when you look out the window, prices seem to be moving quite a lot. If you ever bought a car, I don't expect you just went and said, oh, the list price is whatever, here's, here's the money, right? I mean, you never pay the list price. During COVID, you paid more than the list price if you wanted many cars, and, and typically you pay less and you negotiate or you get a free sunroof or something or good financing if there are lots of cars sitting in the lot. If you ever buy airline tickets, you'll know that prices are not fixed. 
if you ever buy vegetables, you'll know that prices change from day to day. If you were to buy oil for your furnace, you know that oil prices are not, are not constant. It seems to me that a lot of prices are very flexible. And if we think of, of recent developments with dynamic pricing, often guided by artificial intelligence, then that, that flexibility has, has increased. Um, a um, a um, report by, by uh, McKinley uh, noted that, uh, that Amazon is repricing millions of goods every few minutes. That's hard to square with having sticky prices and uh, and and uh, and uh, something that 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 um, enables uh, aggregate demand to have to have uh, real effects, uh, nominal aggregate demand to have real effects in the short run. So um, here's another study. Um, it's Japanese data, uh, Journal of Monetary Economics, 2010. Um, that's a more systematic study, not just the McKinley report, McKinsey report. Um, they had 3 billion observations, daily observations, from 273 stores over 18 years. So quite a data set. And what they find is that, is that the average price changes every three days in their data set. Now, that's not, that's not price stickiness. That is price flexibility. Um, I discussed some of this in the book because of course New Keynesians also insist that prices are sticky and try to, um, to dismiss sale prices and bargains, which I think is a mistake, um, but um, that's for another, another time. Having said that many prices are, are flexible and have sticky outputs, if General Motors want to increase uh, the production of cars, well, they can do it. But it takes a while be between that decision and then the appearance of more cars in the in the uh, in the lots around the country. It's not so, its output does not, in that sense, respond uh, flexibly um, uh, as as we often assume. Pri uh, sticky output and flexible prices seem to be reasonable for many goods, but. There are also sectors where it's impossible, in a sense, to distinguish between the production and consumption. If you go into a hairdresser, then the production of your haircut takes place as you, as you demand it. It's not something that's being stored and then you have large inventories and then prices go down. Or if you, um, if you go into a store, you have retail workers and the retail workers may be busy if there are many customers. And if there are few customers, they sort of um, hang out, talk to each other, or do a little bit of, of a reorganization of, of, the, of, the, of the store. Or chefs, when you go to a restaurant, okay, they do some prep work before, before the customers arrive. But basically, the, the wait staff and the chefs how hard they work, how busy they are, depends on demand. You cannot separate the, the production from, <coughs> from, uh, from the actual appearance of demand. These are examples of sectors that have flexible output. They have sticky employment. You can't change the, the number of chefs instantaneously but they have variable labor utilization. And this is what allows output to be, to be flexible. So what I want to do today is to set up this baseline flex output model. So assume that in, in, the, in the very simple setting here, that prices and wages are fixed and then have output vary and being, being a position to vary, because you have this variable utilization rate of labor. Assumptions, basic assumptions. Well, we have sticky employment, as I said. We cannot change the number of, of employees that are, that are working in the store. We cannot do that instantaneously. But we can change it over time 
relatively fast, faster than we can change the fiscal, the the uh, the fixed capital stock. We can change number of employees faster than we can change the number of stores. So what what the firm decides at any moment is in time is is how fast to change the employment level. L is employment, and a hat, L hat is D D T L divided by L. So that's the growth rate of the of the uh, employment. What does that depend on? What makes firms want to change their employment level? Well, they get signals, and they get signals. One of which is the the current utilization rate of labor. So output in the retail sector, for instance, is the sales, how many customers, and you have the number of employees. If they're working flat out, then you would want to hire more people. And so you would get a positive derivative here. Higher utilization rate of labor makes you want to hire more workers in order to meet demand. But you have to think of the constraints as well. And one constraint is the current employment relative to the capital stock. If you think again in simple terms, if you have this, this uh, retail outlet, you can, uh, you can employ a variable, a number of employees, but, but only up to a point. I mean, there's a limit to how many workers you can have in a single store of a certain size. And if you are close to having having fully utilized your capital capacity, then you will not hire more workers. So you get a negative impact as you get close to close to full capital uh, full capital capacity utilization. You would not have um, an incentive to hire more workers. And then there's the the employment rate. That's employment relative to, to the total labor force. If we are close to full employment, this is a, a mature economy model that is sort of hovering around something close to full employment. But if, as you get closer to full employment, it becomes harder to find workers that have the, the skills that you want. Um, and if you do want to hire them, you may have to give them incentives, whether it's sign on bonuses or attractive wages, raise your wages or do something else to make your job attractive to them. And of course, if it's expensive to hire to hire people to increase your, your labor force, then that acts as a deterrent. So a simple specification here that says employment response and it responds to signals from demand and to the capacity constraints the supply side signals that you get i'll assume for simplicity here that the uh, labor force grows at a constant rate baseline investment um, a standard assumption certainly in post keynesian uh, theory is that uh, the accumulation rate would depend on the output capital ratio and maybe on the profit share and a few other variables. But the output capital ratio is probably the sort of key variable that everybody always includes. Now, in this model, you can write this as the product of labor productivity and the labor capital ratio. And I will, and that's because I think it's reasonable, I would, I would, I would keep only the labor capital ratio. Why? Well, the, the labor productivity is this fast jump variable. It moves quickly, moves instantaneously to any demand shock. But you don't start investing in new, in new fixed capital because of, of blips that may be very, very short lasting, very short lived. You only start investing in, in capital if you have if you have blips that seem to last longer. And if they last longer, they will map into the, the labor capital ratio. So that's the assumption here that we have the accumulation rate depending on the labor capital ratio. Consumption and saving. 
I could talk about this and why I choose this specification for a long time, but it's fairly standard in some sense. So let me just leave it at that. I'll assume a consumption depends, pi is the profit share. So consumption depends on wage income and it depends on wealth. Um, one, let me note, one simplification in this model is that I treat wealth as just the physical capital stock. Here, there's no, there's no financial assets in a corporate economy. You would have actually households, um, ultimate owners owning firms via financial assets, via their ownership of, of the shares and bonds and not direct ownership of the physical capital. That distinction I leave out here and treat capital as the, as the, as the wealth variable. So standard, in many ways, standard uh, as the specification, wage income and wealth is what determines consumption. And then you can rewrite that as a saving to capital equation where you have saving to capital now depending on labor utilization, on the labor to capital ratio, on the profit share, and then the rest are, par are parameters. Real wages, as I said, this is a, a constant real wage, but prices and wages are taken to be constant in the baseline model. Profit share by definition is given by this expression here, one minus the real wage divided by labor productivity. And note that labor productivity will not be constant. That's going to respond to, to demand, to movements in demand. And that means that although we have a constant real wage, the profit share will not be constant either. This, incidentally, I didn't mention that, but maybe I'll say it now so I don't forget. Um, because of this, this dependence on the profit share on productivity, models in which you allow perfect price flexibility turn out to behave the reduced forms to be extremely similar, give the same kind of patterns as models in which you treat the real wage as fixed and allow labor productivity to change. Labor productivity and the profit share essentially will move in the same direction and they will give the same kind of feedback effects to the rest of the system. This is important because that means that there's some hope that even though some goods may have fixed prices and others have flexible prices, the overall economy might end up behaving just like either of those two systems. They, they basically give the same predictions. Okay, I've completed the baseline model since this is a closed economy model, there's no public sector. And so we get standard equilibrium condition, you can solve that. And when you solve that, you will find that the, uh, the labor utilization is now determined. That is the accommodating variable in the, in the very short run. Any change in demand maps instantaneously into labor, into labor productivity and then derived effects on employment and, and the capital stock. You can now do the math and it's simple, straightforward to find that we get a, a two-dimensional system of differential equations. It's also easy to see that there's a unique, non-trivial stationary solution. I didn't mention this, but let me just say again that, or let me say here that x dot will always denote dx dt, so that's the time derivative, and x hat, again, if you see something like that, that is the growth rate of the variable x. So we have a, a unique, non-trivial, stationary solution. We have trivial solutions where L and E are equal to zero, but they're not very interesting. Um, the stability properties of this stationary solution depends, not surprisingly, on the specification of the, of the functions. I use in calibration here, so I can simulate the system and see what are the likely outcomes, I use um, these, these specifications and uh, the, um, 
investment function. I've kept linear. We know very little about the investment function. Uh, but the parameters of the investment function are based on on empirical work that uh, Ben Zibera did in a paper with me back in 2012. There's a little bit of translation because we used a specification that did not have have uh, flexible output, but instead have flexible prices. But mapping mapping our results into this setting, these are this is this is uh, parameter values that are that are within the range that that we find we Ben Zibra did different different specification, different econometric uh, exercises, and, and this is sort of within that range. The uh, function here, which describes the response of um, employment to observed uh, variables in both um, labor markets and, uh, and demand, labor productivity, and the, uh, the, the capital stock, um, is nonlinear, and I think there are good reasons for that. Um, I, we can come back to it. I'd be happy to discuss it, but uh, but uh, this somewhat forbidding uh, uh, looking uh, equation uh, has sort of relatively simple interpretation. And again, the parameters are based on Ben Zibra's uh, estimates in this paper. So um, does that mean that this is how the economy works? Well, it means that there's some empirical support for using these particular parameters. Having specified now the, the equations, um, I can simulate it. And what you find is local instability. The steady, the stationary state is unique, but it's locally unstable. And the model generates limit cycles. If you look at the limit cycle and the patterns that the limit cycle displays, then it actually matches features of the US business cycle including clockwise patterns in, in a in employment output capital ratio space, employment profit share space, employment growth rate space, profit share um, growth rate place, and output capital ratio uh, growth rate uh, space. These are all matched qualitatively by what the model predicts which given the simplicity of the model, given the, the, and the fact that it was, it was derived not in order to generate these patterns, but because the, the assumptions seem to make behavioral sense. Given that, that, that this is the background to the construction model, the construction of the model, I think this is, this is um, in some ways quite impressive. Uh, there are problems, of course. Some relative magnitudes of the cycles are off, and uh, there are some observed patterns that the model cannot reproduce. That's not surprising, given the simplicity and given what is left out. More important as a weakness, I think, is the fragility. And that goes back to, to some of the stuff I mentioned at the beginning um, of the talk, namely that often dynamic models are very sensitive to precise choices of uh, parameters. And uh, that comes out clearly in this example. I chose a, an investment coefficient of one. If you look here, the coefficient on L is one. So the response of a, an increase in, in the labor capital ratio uh, is one for one with the with the uh, with the investment capital ratio. Now, if you were to increase that coefficient to 1.075, you would no longer get a limit cycle. You would now get explosive divergence. And if you were to reduce it by just a little bit to 0.985, you would no longer get a limit cycle. You would get convergence. So an extreme sensitivity, my choice of one was within the range of, of the parameters that Ben Zipper and I found. But there are other parameter values also within the range that would be acceptable based on our estimates, and they would give qualitatively different outcomes. And that's not comfortable. Something that's so sensitive 
to a model that's so sensitive to parameter values has to be taken with um, has to be met with some skepticism. Um, here, just to illustrate, is uh, parameter value one. You get convergence. This is the employment rate output capital ratio. You get nice convergence to this limit cycle. But once you increase the parameter value to 1.08, you just collapse. You start out cycling, and then psh, the economy collapses. So, what did I do then? And this is this is um, this is recent work, and it's it's uh, in the book, and it's also in a, in a paper that is published in Gibo, 2023. In some ways, actually, I'll draw perhaps even more than uh, than thank you even more than uh, than uh, uh, on Jeepo than on the uh, on the on the chapter in the book i introduced some elements that are only in the in the Jeepo paper what i do now is i introduced um, a policy and first fiscal policy government spending which is based on something that's fairly smooth. You don't change government spending typically an awful lot um, over the cycle, but also allows for, for reactions in extreme cases. Like when you had the, the financial crisis, the Obama stimulus package was introduced, um, and the same way COVID, where you get fiscal policy, you get fiscal stimulus in extreme situations, and that's captured by a cubic term here. Automatic stabilizers in the form of taxes and transfers, depending on taxes, depending on income, transfers, depending to a large extent on employment rates. High unemployment leads to leads to higher transfers, uh, unemployment benefits, etc. Standard equation for debt dynamics. Um, monetary policy. This is uh, basically a, a Taylor rule with gradual adjustment. It uh, it matches uh, it matches the uh, the uh, work in Clarida et al. 2000 Quarterly Journal of Economics. There's interest rate smoothing, so it's not the interest rate that adjusts immediately. Um, you have a target interest rate that depends on inflation and uh, and uh, 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 the the uh, the uh, presence of of, uh, of uh, ca capacity constraints or or absence of, ca of 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 constraints of that kind, supply side constraints, and then you have the interest rate responding to the deviation between between the uh, target and the current rate. Um, but with a modification that there's a zero lower bound. So I've int introduced that. Yeah. Wage and price Phillips curves, they follow um, specifications that are quite common. I particularly work by Peter Flesho and some of his co-authors in specifying a wage inflation curve and a price inflation curve. And then when you combine those, you can uh, you can get equations that describe the evolution of the real wage and the evolution of inflation coming out from this sort of conflict inflation relatively standard framework. Investment function, the simple investment function is far too primitive. So what I've done here is that I've introduced other variables in the target accumulation function, including the profit share, the real interest rate, the employment rate and a variable to capture growth expectations. So they all now influence influence um, target inflation. And then you have inflation adjusting gradually to to um, to uh, whoops, this was the one I wanted to highlight. You have you have expect uh, inflate you have accumulation adjusting gradually to what is the target um, accumulation rate. You also have dynamics of the growth expectations. I could talk about it for a long time, but I think these, these, um, these uh, extensions are quite well motivated 
Um, in fact, they, they tend to increase the instability, so they don't really help me to, uh, to avoid uh, breakdowns. Uh, but I think they are well motivated. Investment does not respond as quickly as, as the simple model uh, um, indicated. Now, having made these, these, uh, these uh, changes, I end up with, a, with an eight-dimensional system of differential equations. And that's, that's something that, that makes me nervous. I'm happy with two-dimensional. I can live with three, but once it's above three, um, I get very nervous. Um, but um, but this is what came out of it. Fortunately, um, some of these uh, equations are, are directly motivated by empirical work. That goes for the for the uh, Taylor rule for the uh, for the monetary policy. It goes for the dynamics of, of wages and prices, the inflation equations. And the, um, the um, fiscal policy equations also can be calibrated on U.S. data. You can look at what are the average uh, tax rates. You can look at what are the, the average expenses, uh, expenses on, on uh, employment-related uh, 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 subsidies and unemployment benefits. And so you can, you can, um, you can try to calibrate these using, using uh, uh, numbers that are that are reasonable for the U.S. economy, and this is what I did. And um, the one thing that's hard to calibrate in that sense, because we know very little about it, is the investment function. Um, there's been, I think, remarkably little work on investment functions in the mainstream tradition over the last many years. Um, and uh, what work there has been has often followed a, a methodology that is that is quite different from what from what I find most appealing. Looking at Q theory, for instance, um, and the main study, the heterodox tradition has produced um, estimates of the investment function, but I don't think we are close to anything like a consensus. And I think it may be hard to get a consensus because investment functions notoriously are. Uh, may be a bit unstable. Um, what I've done is that I have uh, I have picked parameter values um, that I think are in line with with what we know. I find them plausible. Um, we can discuss that, and you may disagree. Some parameters are relatively straightforward. Some are not that important. I've tried to pick parameter values that I thought were reasonable. One of the ones that's really important is the coefficient on the on the um, employment to capital ratio. That was the one parameter I had in the in the baseline model, and that is still a key parameter. And so, what I'll do then, having specified this this um, this benchmark version, I will allow this row one to vary and see how results depend on that. So that's that's the the uh, my attempt to look at the sensitivity of the of the model. Clearly, I have in this 8D model, I have a large number of parameters, and one could, if one were better at simulation work, I guess one could do a more comprehensive analysis of how sensitive is the model to all the different parameters. I haven't done that. I looked at this, which I think is a key parameter and one that we know relatively little about. The uh, calibration of wages and prices, as I said, work by Peter Flasher has been stimulating my specification here. And I basically um, picked parameters that are in line with his work with Kralsik and his work with Diallo, and then work by Blanchard. So this is, these are the parameter values. Um, I feel uh, confident about them in the sense that I think they are certainly ballpark estimates. Other people may have slightly different estimates, but these are, are reasonable. Fiscal policy, again, I have um, I picked parameters, as I said, based on US stylized data for fiscal policy. And the Taylor rule parameters are based on the estimates in the Clarita and co-authors Clarida, Gali, and Gödler from 2000. Um, with these parameter values, 
what I get is, is a much higher degree of robustness. The model produces limit cycles when my the key parameter that I'm examining the effects of when row one is greater than 0.89. You still get limit cycles. You get no collapse, even as you increase this parameter to as high as 10, which is an insane number. It's an insane number. It's way, way high. Think back to the simple model where when I increase the parameter from one to 1.075, you've got a collapse. So this here is, is an immense increase in robustness. You get slow oscillatory convergence when you have parameter values between 0.5 and 0.89. And then when you go below 0.5, you may get something that's monotonic convergence. But robustness to an extent that does not characterize the other the other model. Here's the the benchmark model. In fact, as you can see, well you can't see, but you get these these cycles. And if I were to run it for a couple of thousand uh, periods, you would get it converging into into this point. This is precisely the threshold value. This is where the limit cycle has shrunk to a diameter of zero. So this is kind of convergence to a point. But it happens so slowly, which is another way of saying that having slow convergence for practical purposes is, is the same as having, as having uh, persistent cycles. And here's with um, row one equal to 10. And you can see we now get a limit cycle. The amplitude is large, but it does not collapse. The stabilizing forces when we move far away from equilibrium are strong enough. The patterns match all the simulated, or all the systematic bivariate patterns that Zebra and I identified in another paper. And it match, matches the real wage patterns in, um, in a paper by Diallo. And uh, let me just say briefly that, that I think even this underestimates the kind of robustness of the model. Endogenous policy means that if we have poor performance, you would tend to get a change in policy rules. You got quantitative easing when traditional monetary policy didn't seem to work and we needed something else. You got the Obama stimulus package when we had the, the, uh, the, uh, the financial the, the recession after the financial crisis. And Japanese stagnation has been met by steadily increasing um, debt levels. So, and once you have this, 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 this reaction of fiscal and monetary policy, that may help stabilize the model further. Okay, so let me, let me try to briefly summarize. I know I've run over already, uh, but uh, I'll try to be very brief now. What I've been trying to argue here is that, is that when you look at the dynamic interactions in capitalist economies, then they are likely to generate local instability of the steady growth path, and it's likely to lead to endogenous cycles. When you calibrate a Marx-Keynes model, it fits the stylized facts of US business cycles. The outcomes become robust once you have uh, the policy rules included, and in particular, it would probably become even more robust when you allow for the endogeneity of the policy rules. I hasten to add, but I'm not for a minute arguing that policy rules are optimal. Whatever that may mean in a society with conflicts and different interests, it's not clear what optimal would mean in the first place. And we know that uh, often policies are not optimal by even by, by very simple, very, very basic criteria that, that maybe most people can agree on. Um, and then the overall, the overall, I guess, argument that I've been trying to make in the book and that this exemplifies is that uh, in my view, what I call a structuralist and behavioral approach to macroeconomics is more promising 
than the prevailing orthodoxy with the new Keynesian DSGE models as maybe the flagship of this tradition. Um, these models are, I would argue, based on implausible behavioral assumptions, inappropriate aggregation, and relying on a large number of imaginary shocks um, in order to account for uh, business cycles and uh, unobserved phenomena. I think we can do better, but I think in order to do better, we need to kind of revisit some of the some of the um, the basic assumptions behind behind the contemporary macro. Sorry if I've run over time, was it loose? But uh, I've stopped now. So thanks for listening. Okay, many okay. thanks, Peter, for your brilliant lecture. Uh, before I uh, give the, the, the floor to Fernando Olanda, let me just show to the, our audience the first book of uh, Peter Scott that he mentioned in his, uh, his presentation, mm -hmm. Conflict in Effective Demand in Economic Growth. I remember that I bought this book when I'm doing my PhD at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And when I, I, I realized that Scott uh, presents that uh, the idea that prices are not stick, uh, there's no such a thing as a stick prices, but we have uh, costs not to change prices, but costs to change output. And uh, I think that's a, a, a very important insight, including this is, I think, what Keynes have in his own mind. My former master uh, supervisor at Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, Eduardo Amadeu, wrote his PhD thesis under the supervision of uh, Stephen Marlin uh, and was published in a book in 1989 uh, called Keynes' Principle of Effective Demand. And uh, Eduardo Amadeu shows that both on the treaties and money and on the general theory, uh, prices are flexible. So in Keynes theory, there is no such a thing as price rigidity. It's, it's simply wrong. It's a wrong interpretation of Keynes' ideas. But Professor Peter Scott made uh, uh, an interesting uh, theoretical framework showing the implications of the, this new dichotomy of you have flexible prices, but uh, cost to, to change out. Okay, so uh, Professor Fernando Lara Barbosa, now the floor is yours for your comments, criticism, and so on and so forth. Tá, 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 tá desligado. You have to turn on. Yeah, yes. Now it's. Yes, now, now we are here. Okay. So first of all, let me thank you for the invitation, Lero. And it's a pleasure to comment on uh, Professor Pete Scott lecture. But uh, I'm going to take his paper as a representative agent of his uh, talk here. No? The paper is Endogenous Business Cycle and Economic Policy. No? And uh, the first thing that I want to point out, you know, there are two ways to deal with uh, cycles. No? One comes from the Slutsk approach. It's a very well-known paper published by Econometrica in the 30s that uh, if you have a cycle, you have to have uh, shocks plus propagation. So that's the traditional approach and that's the approach that has been used in macroeconomics since then. The other approach is the nonlinear dynamics. The nonlinear dynamics can be used as a, a voice Keynesian or it's used in overlapping generations. It can generate cycles, but it seems to be that's not a very good environment to reproduce the world. Huh? So, so we have uh, RBC, the real business cycle model that is based on the Slutsk's approach. And I will call uh, the 
Peter Scott uh, approach as NLDBC. NLDBC is nonlinear dynamics business cycle approach. No? So you want to have a dynamic system with uh, some properties that can produce limits cycles uh, get in your business cycle. No? In his paper, he has three major conclusions. No? The first conclusion is that the endogenous cycles generated by the model provide a good fit with observed cyclical patterns for the US economy. So the first conclusion is I have a good fit. The second conclusion is the properties of nonlinear dynamic system can be very sensitive to the precise specification of the system and it would appear to raise serious questions about the empirical relevance of the model if small changes in parameters can lead to unbounded divergence. So the second one you say, well, is a good fit, but if is if there is some small changes, it's going to create a big problem. The mod the mod is going to blow up. And the third the third conclusion is economic policy is endogenous, and this endogeneity strengths the robustness argument. Shifts in private sector behavior that threaten to produce cumulative divergence or significant increases in the amplitude of the fluctuations of key macroeconomic variables will almost certainly provoke changes in economic policy. So it seems to me that the third conclusion says, well, if small changes create problems, I have economic policy that can correct some of those big problems. Then I'll change from your paper and I'm going to quote one economist that has just a few months ago published the fiscal theory of the price level, which is John Crockett. He is a 800 page book. And he has some strong comments about a lot of things. One, at page 425, he states that old Keynesian models aren't, are not economic models. Let me repeat. Old Keynesian models are not economic models. Huh? So when I read this stuff, I, my reaction was, what's the definition of a model? How can I define a model? No? So my definition is based on Popper. Model is a falsifiable representation of a phenomenon. Model is a falsifiable representation of a phenomenon. It does not matter if it's Marx, Keynesian, Neoclassic, or whatever you want to. So if you have a phenomenon, you have to have a falsifiable representation of a phenomenon. So Keynesian model is an economic model because it's a falsifiable representation of a phenomenon. And according to Popper, a model should be tested according to four rules. The first one is internal consistency. You have to be consistent, otherwise I mean you throw away your model. The second rule is the logical form. If you have uh, empirical content or if you are a tautology. If you are a tautology, that's not a model. The third is that you have to have scientific advance. 
in comparison with other models. Is your model an advancement or it does not bring nothing new? And the fourth is empirical test. So you have to test your model. You have to do some empirical test. Huh? Otherwise, I mean, if you have a model, if you don't have test, how can I trust your model? So there are several ways to test a model. Huh? One is a controlled experiment. Uh, controlled experiment is the whole gray of science. But in economics, a controlled experiment is a very difficult. You can have econometric tests. That's the way that you use to test a lot of models. We use econometric models. No? The third is economic, economic policy experiment. If you have a economic policy experiments, you can have, it's a, it's a good way to test the model. For instance, here in Latin America, the heterodox stabilization plans in Latin America, they were tested and rejected. All stabilization plans, they are completely failed. There is another one experiment that's a very interesting one that is supply side economics of Reagan. It was a completely failure. Supply side economics did not work. But the most interesting experiment in the world during the last century was the Soviet experiment. The Soviet experiment was terrible. It did not work in any place, any country. So you have a, a fantastic experiment. If you don't have a market economy, it's going to be a big failure. Experiment that is a very interesting one, but I think most of Latin American people they don't want to recognize is the import substitution industrialization policy in Latin America. They were completely failure. It did not work. Then there is another one that was a success. That is import substitution and export promote industrialization. That was the policy that was used in Asia, in Japan, in Taiwan, in South Korea, and nowadays in China. The other way to test your experiments or your model is the calibration experiment. Calibration experiment is a very powerful tool to test some models. The first model that used calibration techniques to test it was solo 1957. The solo model said that uh, growth comes from accumulation of a physical capital relationship between capital and labor. Eh? And then solo did the experiment, it is a, is a complete failure. Most of growth does not come from physical accumulation. So let's work and see what we can find out because accumulation of physical capital is not producing the growth that we see in the world. That was a fantastic experiment because everybody recognized that technical change was the key ingredient for growth. Uh, the second uh, calibration experiment was one by Mera and Prescott about the equity premium. The title of their paper is the equity premium, a puzzler. I think that's not a puzzler. Everything that now it's a puzzle is that because that model was rejected. When a model is rejected, you say, well, there is a puzzle here. There is no puzzle. 
the mother was not able to account for the empirical facts <coughs> you observe in the world. So the capital asset price model was projected based on calibration. And now I'm going to talk about uh, a kind of disease that is uh, very popular among uh, some economists nowadays. I, I mean, I don't have a better name, so I will call it the Lucas Critique Syndrome. The Lucas Critique Syndrome. I think most of us would agree with the Lucas Critique that behavior changes when the rules of the game change. If the rules of the game change, nobody's going to play it again the same way. I use a very simple example in my football every week. Once we organize in a different way, the players, they play in a different way. But the Lucas Critique syndrome is a disease whereby the analyst makes in unwarranted assumptions to get a model with micro foundations. They pay any price to get the micro foundation. And the syndrome is not about unrealistic assumptions, but the use of untenable assumptions to build a model. Let me give a simple example. If you want to model a open, a small open economy, okay, you cannot use the representative agent model because if you have a representative agent model in this small open economy, you are not going to get an equilibrium in the balance of payments and an equilibrium at the level of the debt. So it's impossible. Either the small country becomes the owner of the world or the, this small country is going to have a huge external debt. But the people pursue it this way, making ad hoc assumptions to close the model. That's not just in the oh, it's more open economy. No? If you want to get a, a small open economy with micro foundations, you have to go to overlapping generations model. So you need to have different people in this world to get equilibrium and to get some results that... You know. The problem with the Lucas Critique syndrome is because uh, the preference of the research is based on lexicographic preference. I don't know if everybody uh, knows what is about the lexicography. Lexicograph preference comes from the alphabet. A comes first, then B, then C. And so in the lexicographic preference, there is no trade-off between goods at the utility function. You have a preference for something, and you are not willing to trade off nothing for that. So you are uh, a person with lexicograph preference and, uh, and uh, you don't want to give up something for micro foundations. Eh? And it seems to me that uh, the new Canadian model has a lot of problems. I, who wrote a paper, just uh, I finished the paper the day before yesterday. And uh, the title of the paper is Letting the Cat Out of the Bag, the Canonical New Canadian Model. So I repeat, it's Letting the Cat Out of the Bag, the Canonical New Canadian Model, because there are some hidden assumptions that are crucial for the conclusions. Once you get rid of those assumptions, the conclusions are gone. 
So, and then I'm going to finish my comments with a statement. It's well known that the fundamental tenet of scientific methodology is to generate refutable implications of a model. Either you have some refutable implications of your model or something very big is lacking. I build a model and then I have to state very clear what kind of it would reject my model. Otherwise, I mean, it's a game that's not a scientific game. So, if you don't have refutable implications, the model would be void of empirical content. And then that's my criticism of your work. Lucas critique gave birth to the real business cycle and to the new Keynesian model. And the new Keynesian model refuses to have refutable implications, just calibration and simulation. Calibration, simulation, you want to do? It's very easy. And say, ah, my model fits the data of the US economy. What are the refutable implications of your model? What Freeze. are the refutable yeah. implications of the real business cycle? What are the refutable oh, implications of the new Keynesian model? So if you want to build you. Fernando. With nonlinear oh. dynamic model. Hmm? So no, my. It's, it's freezed. Uh, 30 seconds freeze. Pardon? Hello. Are you listening? I think that we have a problem in the yeah, transmission. So what, what my conclusion is about this kind of uh, uh, model is that if you rely on simulations and uh, and uh, try to compute and to reproduce the economy, yeah? how can I rely on your model? What experiment do you make your model? So, if you want to, I mean, to play a scientific game, you have to give up this uh, uh, Prescott approach. Prescott approach is, well, you build a model and then you calibrate and then you do the simulation. So in this game, there is no falsifiable implications. There is no how to reject a model and everybody is doing that kind of game. So my criticism is about the methodology that you are using. And you are using the same methodology of the people that you are uh, criticizing. And you have to explain how model Fernando, I think that's freeze again. All right. Thank you for your... Ah, yeah. okay. Okay, uh, before I give the word to, to, to Peter Scott, I have just to, to make two, two considerations. The first one is, uh, of course, about scientific methodology. I believe that all of us have seen the... <laughs> <laughs> I think that all of us had uh, seen the movie Oppenheimer in the movie, in the movies. I saw the film, it was a fantastic film. And there is a scene 
in which uh, Oppenheimer, during a class uh, for his PhD students, just uh, thought uh, about the possibility of existence of black holes, you know? And, uh, well, uh, that, that is, I believe, five or six years ago, or, or, or less than that, that NASA had made a picture about a black hole, you know? So uh, many phenomena that uh, can be just uh, reviewed by, by theory are confirmed by empirical verifications just after 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. We are still uh, proving many of the falsifiable assumptions of the uh, general relativity theory of Einstein and uh, Oppenheimer and the me me uh, quantum mechanics of Oppenheimer. Uh, regarding uh, the question of simulation, uh, calibration, calibration simulation, uh, for myself, what is my, my, my methodology is to run the model many, many, many times, you know, with different values of the parameters, and then use a Monte Carlo simulation in order to get the regularities. What are the regularities that the model produce along 50,000 realizations of, of, of the model? So uh, you can compare the regularities of uh, thousands of simulations uh, of the model with the, the, the empirical data. And I talk, uh, I have a friend in the physics department of University of Brasilia, uh, Professor Tarcisio Mariano, that uh, explains to me that is precisely the method of physics. They use both, they use uh, both uh, small scale models just to, to, to know the intuition about how the, the physical world uh, works. But then they go to, to very large models uh, that have to be uh, simulated, and they simulated a lot uh, in order to 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 have some regularities. This is uh, precisely the way that they make the predictions about the the climate change. They use this huge, fantastic, giant uh, uh, computable <laughs> models. Uh, they simulate them, but they simulate they made a lot of simulations, and they take some regularities. Uh, and basically what uh, uh, they conclude uh, is that climate change is even worse than the models predict. Okay, but Peter, uh, now your, is your reply. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I, actually, I actually find in some ways much less disagreement than maybe I had expected in advance. Um, I completely agree but the Lucas critique is correct. In fact, uh, I don't even think it was, it was original with Lucas. He did express it particularly forcefully, but, um, but uh, Abba Lerner back in 1943 or 40 or whenever, I've forgotten the exact date, argued that once we had Keynesian, uh, Keynesian tools, uh, it would probably change the behavior of firms and it would be less likely that we would run into serious uh, recessions because firms would now not uh, contract nearly as much as they had in the face of minor downturns in, in demand. So the Lucas critique, the fact that behavioral equations uh, are likely to, to shift or at least can shift empirically how much they do it is 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 an open question but they uh, they can shift in response to whether it's changing in policies or it's uh, changes in income distribution for whatever other reason or that i think is uh, is undeniable i don't think any keynesian economist would ever deny that expectations are important and if expectations change then you would expect to see changes in behavioral equations. What is wrong with the mainstream is the Lucas solution. It's the way that that problem was addressed. That I think has no foundation at all. And I think, and that brings me to another part of what you were talking about. I think that 
but much of what has happened in mainstream economics has been in that sense purely scholastic in a sense we have to build on our simple model from micro theory of uh, perfect optimization by individuals with uh, given exogenous preferences and uh, and uh, uh, great cognitive abilities and foresight this is what constitutes microeconomic foundations this is our assurance against the the uh, the lucas critique and i think that's absolutely wrong i think we should we should be behavioral we should look at micro but we need to do that by looking at the actual evidence and the systematic evidence we have of micro behavior points to i think these systematic and macroeconomically relevant deviations from what we usually assume so we need to we need to be aware of the lucas critique and we need to do something that takes into account microeconomic behavior it's just that the way it has been done is this sort of scholastic oh this is the right way the micro theory of traditional variation modeling basically is what we need to build on that is where it goes wrong it becomes scholastic rather than empirically based i make a lot of assumptions along the way and of course in the macro model i talked about today it was it was there was not that much discussion of of microeconomic behavior but i make assumptions along the way i argue for different ways of specifying the functions and that is based on on my reading of the evidence it's an empirical judgment and i think i think this empirical judgment comes in not just in the sense of of testing in a formal way having here some equation now let me let me test it econometrically and i come out with a tested uh, statistic i think i think we need to be empirically based in the sense that we look carefully at at what goes into our assumptions are they are they based on something that actually has empirical support and in in drawing on finding that support of course we can actually for some of the micro stories we can even even get sort of at least semi controlled experiments there's a lot of experimental work where you have people given uh, put in, in in various situations and you see how they react okay there are all kinds of of, of issues in moving from the the lab to the real world the sort of external validity question so i'm not claiming that it's without problems but we do have a, a, a lot of of microeconomic evidence some of it experimental some of it from microeconomic studies where they we try to control for things and run regressions and we can build on some of that when we construct the uh, equations that go into the macro model we can also and i didn't talk about this and i am not an empirical person i've never i mean when i have when there's any regression in something i've written it's done by a co-author I, I, it's not my field but i think i think uh, i think we do have the predictions and i think take something simple as as the effects of fiscal policy where for for the longest time it was sort of standard uh, dogma in mainstream that that fiscal policy was largely ineffective tax changes didn't matter because of the recurrent equivalence and and we actually have evidence that that this is wrong that uh, that uh, we do see we do see effects of fiscal policy that are pretty much in line with what uh, what old keynesian um, theory predicted and and pretty much in line with also what i have in in, in the specifications i believe so i don't think i don't think it's correct to say that there's no there's no attention to empirics and it's not sort of testable but i would i would um, want to emphasize that that looking at assumptions and try to base those on empirical evidence is incredibly important and i think the mainstream has failed in that respect despite all the talks about microeconomic foundations actually it's not it's not founded on what we know about behavior 
Um, and also, I guess I would want to emphasize that empirical evidence is in my book, not just about, I don't know if we disagree on that. Uh, it's not just about um, about formal statistical tests. I think uh, a lot of a lot of um, evidence will useful evidence comes from from say detailed historical analysis, uh, case studies of firms. Um, I think we need to draw on that as well. Surveys, interviews, um, not drawing on all these sorts of information would uh, impoverish our our empirical work. So, um, yes, uh, I, I agree with you, and I also accept that I have not myself done an awful lot of of the serious empirical work. In fact, I've probably done nothing. But uh, but I do make the claim in the book that uh, that my assumptions are empirically based, and they are to the best of my ability. I've been looking at it, and I'm saying, hey, this is what I think gives a good description of of real life behavior of households in their in their saving and portfolio um, decisions and so it can be challenged on empirical on empirical grounds it's not based on a priori hey we have to start out with this utility function and we have to assume that they're perfectly rational we have to assume in that sense it's it's empirically based rather than just scholastic here's a methodology that you have to follow and if you don't do that it's not serious science so anyway thanks okay we have a, a, a question for, uh, from the audience uh but before uh, just just before the, the the question of thomas hopper i i have a, a an observation regarding the lucas critic critic um, when I'm doing, I was was doing my PhD thesis. I have read uh, a paper of Robert Lucas. I believe that published in 1986 uh, in a journal that is not an economic journal. Okay, and a special issue that also Her Herbert Simon uh, have wrote uh, uh, um, uh, a paper, and uh, uh, in this paper. Uh, Lucas, Robert Lucas, uh, I think that he had the most honest view about what is the rational expectation hypothesis. Uh, according to Lucas, uh, not quoting exactly, but this is very <coughs> similar to, to what I will speak now. He, he Lucas, understands the rational expectations equilibrium as a steady state of a learning process. Repeat, the rational expectation equilibrium is a steady state of a learning process. And here I want to, re uh, to recuperate the famous paper of Paul Davison, uh, published in 1988 and Cambridge Journal of Economics about non-ergodicity. I have uh, this discussion with Fernando Landa about ergodicity and non-ergodicity of a stochastic process. <clears throat> but the, the question is, if the stochastic process that governs the behavior of economic variables are non-stochastic, so learning is impossible because the world is constantly changing. If the world is constantly changing, even if agents rationally try to learn about how the world is, the problem is that it is a moving target. You are trying to, to understand how the, the world works, but uh, during this process, the, <coughs> the world is moving and it can be worse. Uh, we are not, uh, we humans have, we, we try to understand the world to change the world. So in the process of understanding how the world works, the functioning of the world changes. So it's impossible to converge to a rational expectations equilibrium. I remember that many years ago, <coughs> Thomas Sargent wrote a book on what he called uh, uh, bounded rationality. That was an attempt to use uh, some uh, techniques in order 
uh, to converge to a rational expectations equilibrium. And I read his book for, for my PhD thesis. And the general conclusion is that except on the very narrow circumstances, the, the, the learning uh, is impossible. It, it, which means uh, the, you never converge to a rational expectations equilibrium. So, uh, so that's why I, be, I, be, I believe that uh, behavior and adaptive uh, framework for the for modeling the, uh, the behavior of economic agents can be interesting because agents make errors all time and many of agents error are biased so they are constantly changing their uh, decision rules uh, it, <coughs> and they hold the decision rule if the, the mistake is between some some band you know you're not change a model of how you will take a decision of investment just because you commit an error of one percent or 1.2 percent but if your error were 10 percent or 15 percent of course you change your model so uh, uh i think that the the, the basis of the, the lucas uh criticism they which is rational expectations. The idea that rational agents will never commit systematic mistakes, this base is wrong. Because, as in his own words, rational expectations equilibrium presupposes the, the, that the, the, the economy or the system or the agents have reached a steady state of learning process. And it's uh, it's it's uh, uh, it's not proved uh, that this uh, steady state can be reached. Okay, so may, Daniel, may, please throw the I, question. Okay, may Fernando, I, yes. May I interrupt you? Yes. And make a point. Yes. Yes. Of course. Uh, let I want to be very clear about your point. My point is not about uh, that, that question. Huh? If you are, let's say, a Marxist. A Poiskin region, a neoclass. I don't want to make any difference. But the point is, if each of us want to be a scientist, how can I build models? If I want to build a model using micro foundations or not using micro foundations or using empirical facts, for me it's okay. But you have to build a model and state very clear what are the refutable implications of your model. It's, you are obliged to state very clear what kind of prediction your model is making in such a way that it, it can be refutable. So the methodology of science is that. I mean, the real busy people, it's upside down. I calibrate and then I make a simulation. How can I test any proposition of your model? You don't feel obliged to state in a very clear way what kind of prediction can be refutable in your model. So to build a model, let's see. The Keynesian model, the very simple Keynesian model with three equations, Phillips curve, uh, EIS curve, and uh, uh, monetary policy rule, it has clear implications about a lot of facts. Even the new Keynesian model has implications about some facts. But if you go to general equilibrium, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, they don't have any refutable propositions there. They just calibrate and then they make the simulation. When you build a model, post Keynesian, Keynesian, Marxist, or any kind of model, you have to follow the same rules of game if your model is going to be a scientific model. If you don't do that, you are not following proper. 
you have to build models and to present what kind of propositions you have in your model that can be rejected by data. That's my point. And this new ball game introduced by Mayor Prescott, they don't follow these rules of the game. Peter, do you understand? I don't understand that point. If you say that, uh, that uh, the standard new Keynesian model has predictions that are refutable, then I simply do not understand how you can claim that, a, that another fo formal model with specific equations that, uh, that have observable variable have, would have no testable implications. Of course it does. It doesn't differ in that respect. It, it specifies relationships. And if the, if the new Keynesian model is, is refutable, and I haven't refuted, I don't think it fits very well. I think it only fits because of a lot of ad hoc assumptions. But, but, but I don't see how other models uh, that, have, that have observable variables. And of what I'm formalized. saying. What I'm saying is that you are not clear in your paper or in your presentation what kind of refutable propositions you have in your model. You have to be state very clear what kind of refutable propositions you have. Clear, I mean, I suppose you have, but you, you are not work out those propositions. Your emphasis is more in calibration and simulation. Instead of saying, well, my model can predict such and such that no other model can predict, for instance, is a very strong proposition. You can say, well, my model would predict some relationship between such and such variables that other models like the real business cycle cannot predict. That's a very strong proposition. But to say that your model can fit the data as well as the real business cycle model, it's empty. So you need to state in a very clear way what kind of propositions you have in your model. And you don't pay attention to that. You just play the game of the real business people. You say, well, they do that. I can do that as well. I'm, my, I'm my, my, my very brief response to that is that Yes, I would love to see a lot of empirical work. I would love to see also formal econometric work. I am not the right person to do the formal econometric work. But basically what it seems to me you're requesting or requiring is that in one paper, I not just present an alternative approach, but also go through and test all the implications. I felt I was rushing through just presenting the ideas. And I think uh, the, the requiring that any paper has to go through and actually do the testing and uh, lay out all the possible implications, it's a non-starter. No paper does that. So it, it's, it's I'm, I'm with you that we need much more empirical work. And I would love to see more empirical work pursuing not the the new Keynesian orthodoxy framework, but instead being guided by this different framework. In fact, the last the last chapter of the book, I tried to comment a bit on the recent sort of um, evidence-based macroeconomics, uh, which I think in some ways produces insights that are interesting and valuable. But where the, the participants in that sometimes, I won't say always, but at least many times, seem to jump from some very detailed, careful econometric work to drawing conclusions for within a framework uh, of New Keynesian models as if, as if the, the careful empirical work itself justifies the various assumptions that go into the new Keynesian model and they now interpret the evidence through that lens without being even aware that they seem to have now imposed a theoretical framework that itself 
has not been substantiated by by the evidence they presented. So anyway, um, I, I, but I, I I certainly agree that we need a lot more empirical work, and I would love to see people who are better at that um, pull apart and tell me where my specifications uh, have been falsified. And uh, I I am not I'm not wedded to the precise specifications. What I do feel very strongly and what I'm convinced about is that as a general approach, this sort of try to be empirically um, supported rather than scholastically motivated in theoretical work is, is the way to go. And I think we need to look at the interactions between agents and across different markets and sectors. And I think when we do that, we are likely to find a lot of complications that just do not appear in the current mainstream, including instabilities and the potential for endogenous cycles. So, um, uh, well, before I finish the, the we now have a, um, a question from Thomas Hatter. Uh, please, uh, Daniel. Uh, okay, question from Thomas Hatter. Question for Peter Scott. Instead of using a target rate of capacity utilization, you use a target investment rate. Is this an attempt to avoid hard her instability in the investment function? That's the question. No, no not at all. In fact, uh, by by including the the the, the extensions, uh, it sort of actually exacerbates the Herodian instability. The Herodian instability. Uh, is embedded in the in the target rate, um, where where you have a strong influence of the of the employment to capital ratio on accumulation, and then in the extended version, uh, you get uh, an added Herodian instability coming in through the the endogenous changes in expected growth rates uh, that respond to past observed growth. So, so uh, the the um, the sources of instability, the sources of, of instability, and thereby of the endogenous business cycle, are very much uh, Herodian instability. That's at the core of it. So, I hope well, that answers well, the question. Well, gentlemen, I think that uh, we have now two hours of webinar. Uh, Many thanks for both of you. Peter, it's always a pleasure to, 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 to talk with you. And Fernando Landa, many thanks for having accepting the invitation for our research group to, to join this webinar and uh, make your comments. And I think that uh, it's very interesting debate uh, between high level economists from both orthodox and the heterodox sides of economics. And uh, I think that we need to do more of that. Uh, and I, th I, I say in our profession, because today uh, I think that we do not have uh, high level debates anymore as we have used to have 30 or 40 years ago. Okay, so uh, thanks for you all, for people uh, that uh, joined us and are until now. Uh, Good well, good evening uh, in Europe, and good afternoon in 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 Latin America and North America. See you soon. Many thanks. Bye bye. Thanks, Fernando. Thanks for your comments, and thanks, uh, for inviting me. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.